Welcome to Finding Holiness, where we delve into timeless Torah wisdom, revealing the sacred in everyday moments. Join us on a journey to elevate your spirituality and discover holiness in every aspect of life. I'm your host, Rabbi David Kadosh, and together, let's embark on a path of spiritual exploration. I hope you enjoy this next episode. Okay, Erev Tov, everybody. Good to have everyone back on, uh, on our Monday night class. Um, we're going to pause at least for one week after this. And uh, next week it seems to be a very busy uh, scheduling week. So we'll, uh, we'll resume Bezat Hashem in a couple of weeks. But uh, right now we're focused on this week's parasha, Parashat Vaishlah. Um, I want to just dedicate this shiur for the refuah shalema of Yelish Ashuim, Ezra Michael ben Yitzhak. Kadosh Baruch should send him a refuah shalema. Um, Bezrat Hashem. Uh, Parashat Vaishlach is a difficult one to read uh, as a Baal Kore and uh, deals with uh, a lot of different uh, mini episodes of Yaakov Avinu. Most, most fam- famously is the, the encounter with his brother Isaac and his preparation to, uh, in that meeting, not knowing what's going to be, knowing that uh, the last time he saw his brother Isaac wanted to kill him and he was afraid. He's afraid of that encounter, and he prepares himself strategically. Uh, it turns out to be not that bad that um, they meet, and uh, Esau gives him a hug and a kiss, not knowing or machlok at whether that hug and kiss was sincere or not. But um, it seems that as they were walking together, you know, Esau says, come, come to my town, come, come with me, and, and Yaakov uh, kind of doesn't want anything of it. And he says, okay, you go to your place, uh, I'll go to my place. Um, and... Um, and that's really the end of the, the encounter. Um, the, the parasha continues with the, um, um, the, uh, the unfortunate, uh, but before that encounter, mind you, I forgot to mention, was the, um, the fight, the wrestling match that he had with the angel of Esav as they were traveling. Uh, that has a lot of significance in our history. Uh, that angel of Esav is, is the Yetzir Hara, which so the, that, that episode, that little scene there, uh, is really what Masavotsiman uh, Banim. I was debating whether to talk about that, but I chose not to. But uh, really, the, our fight with the Yetzara is a constant battle, and we wait until the end of days when the Alot Hashachar, when the when, when the uh, when the sun goes up in the times of Mashiach, where that will no longer be. We will not have to fight the Yetzara, but the Sarosh El is, is is something that we battle constantly. Um, so then after the encounter, we have the unfortunate story with Dina, who was uh, violated and raped by, the, uh, by Hamor, uh, Shechem ben Hamor, Shechem the son of Hamor, which eventually leads to her brothers taking vengeance, Shimon and Levi, going after convincing them that they could join our nation if they just got a brit milah and waiting until they were most vulnerable and in most pain. They go and they, they, they kill, them, kill them all, wipe out their city. Um, and the parasha concludes really with a uh, outline of the uh, of the children of Esav and his descendants, and uh, as well the kings that lived at the time, and uh, that really concludes the parasha. Uh, today, I want to speak about something that I that I mentioned when you when you look at all the the book of Bereshit, <clears throat> and you see really how the hand of God really protected. Our, our matriarchs and our patriarchs in, uh, in incredible ways, how they watched over our forefathers. You know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not allow any man to wrong them. He rebuked any kings concerning them. Everyone remembers how Hashem intervened when Paro took Sarah, uh, when they went down to Egypt. He had a lot of affliction. Because who are you to take Sarai Menu? You can't just take Sarai Menu. And then when Abimelech, the king of Pelishim, tried the exact same thing, also HaKadosh Baruch Hu came to him in a dream and warned him, listen, you're going to die because of the woman that you took. And he got very, very sick. And it wasn't until Abraham really prayed for his, uh, on his behalf that he got better. And if you look through the entire history of the Avot, <clears throat> you'll see that God really stood over each one of them. He didn't allow He didn't allow anybody to come and wrong them. There were no unfortunate incidents 
uh, were strangers, outsiders, who contaminated this holy family of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, except for one time, except for one incident. The exception to this uh, was the incident of Dina, as I mentioned, where Shechem violated her, took advantage of her, and that's the one time where the, the purity of the family was indeed affected in a very serious way. And it's a one tragedy uh, in the history of the Avot. You can argue that the tra- there was tragedy of Yosef and the brothers selling Yosef, definitely, and one that we still pay for. The repercussions still apply right now. But you can argue, we got, we got Yosef back. They, they made peace and, uh, and uh, happily, lived happily ever after at the end of their life. Um, so this, this story um, deserves a lot of study. And, and certainly one 40, 45 minutes you are is not going to be enough to, to talk about this. I just want to focus on one point. Again, the last few weeks we've been talking about words from Victor Miller, and we're going to keep on that. Um, what Dina did, um, is to, to begin with, was very questionable. And uh, Dina was blamed from, the, from, from what it seems like, from the pasuk, uh, for what happened to her. The Torah tells us, Dina bat, bat leah, that Dina went out to go look at the daughters of the land. She went to see. And because she went out to see and to, to glare at everybody and to glance at what the world was about. So, Who saw her? Shechem, the son of Hamor, saw her. And the, her going out was indeed uh, the cause of her debasement from the hands of a non-Jew, from the hands of a Goy. Um, to go out and look at the people of the land, to go out and explore things that you've, that you've never explored or you want to learn about that are not healthy in terms of your spiritual goals or especially if you are the daughter of Yaakov Avinu, there's nothing really good that you can see. And therefore, the less that you see the better off, uh, the better off you are. Um, and so when Dina went out to look, that's when this unfortunate event took place. And that's why the incident occurred. Now, Dina went to see the daughters of the land. That was her curiosity. It wasn't something that was um, idle. She didn't look, go out to the bars. She didn't go out to uh, clubs. You know, her intentions were good. She wanted to see the girls of the land. And she was walking in the footsteps of her ancestors, in fact. The, the Mefarshim explained that just like Sarah was Megayeret et Hanashim, just like Sarah was able to convert the women of her time, and uh, that's how she taught her children and grandchildren to follow her footsteps. So that's how Dina went up. Dina went, went she was sizing up the ladies and to see how could I teach them the same the principles of Emuna? She did she did it for a really, really good purpose. What can I do to these people, these young ladies, that I can convince them and change their outlook, their ashkafa to believe in Hashem? But there was one fundamental difference between Sarah and Dina. And that was Sarah did not go out to the street. When the angels came and they asked Abraham, where is Sarah? Sarah was in the tent. She, she did her kiruv from the inside. While Dina made the mistake of going out. Now, she didn't, again, she didn't go out to, to look at the boys, to look at the men. She went out to look at the girls. But the problem is, when you go out to look at the girls of the land, what do you think you're going to find? <laughs> you're going to find boys with the girls. You're going to find men with the ladies. It was a culture that was not steeped in spirituality at all. So when you're going to go look for the ladies, you're going to find the men as well. And that's where a certain man saw her and took advantage. Now, although it seems a little bit, you know, understood why this happened, um, Chachamim actually go a little bit more fierce in their, um, I won't call it fierce actually, a little bit more delicate. And that's what we're going to really shift our focus to tonight as to why this happened to Dina. And the rabbis explained to us that this incident was not so much a punishment for Dina as much as it was a punishment for Yaakov. It was not only to rebuke Dina, 
Dina was rebuked, but it was a punishment more for her father. Why did it happen to Yaakov that his daughter was violated? Uh, what did Yaakov do to deserve such a tragedy? No, that no father should ever have to experience that their daughter was violated and raped like this. After all, the Torah tells us, V'chen lo yaase. When the brothers came to argue this with Yaakov, they said, this, this, these things just don't happen. And that was their defense, why they went and they, uh, they wiped out the, the, the whole city of Shechem. So the rabbis tell us as follows, and they give us a little bit of background information. Esav, Yaakov's brother, was in the market for a wife. He was single. He had plenty of wives. No, not true. He wasn't single. He had plenty of wives, but he was still looking for wives. And he was always looking for another wife. And Yaakov was coming home from Padan Aram, and he had a beautiful daughter. Dina was his daughter. And he was thinking that if my brother was to put his eyes on my daughter, Dina, I'm going to get a son-in-law, which is also my brother, that I don't want. I don't want this. Now, when a man marries a daughter, uh, when a man marries a woman, um, he's also marrying all, the, the father of the, of the girl, right? The, father, the father-in-law plays a very important role. Same thing the other way around. When the person marries the son, you already got the mother-in-laws there as well. So that's how young men have to think. You look at the pretty face of your wife and you go, oh, I also got my father-in-law here that I have to deal with. I see a little bit of my father-in-law in, 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 in my wife. Um, so if Esav would marry Dina, that means Esav would forever be joined with Yaakov, who is now not only his brother, but his, but his father-in-law. And that was something that Yaakov didn't feel comfortable with. Again, let me remind you what I just said a few minutes ago, that after that, that encounter, yeah, uh, uh, that when they finally met, Esav was actually trying to convince Yaakov to come, let's walk together, let's go to our cities together. And Yaakov said, uh-uh, I don't want that company. The company of Esav is perilous. It's dangerous. It's something that can affect my soul. And I want nothing to do with it. So therefore, when he knew Esav was coming, the Midrash says that he took Dina and he put her into a box, put her into a trunk. And she traveled with the baggage. This is where Dina, how Dina was traveling. But um, a trunk can sometimes be open. You know, the camels, the donkeys, or, or the wagons, whatever, are very bumpy. And uh, maybe... Maybe Esav would, 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 could peek into, the, into the, the box that she was in. So Yaakov was chacham haroet anolad. He nailed down the lid. He made sure, obviously he made sure that she could breathe, but it was, it was closed and secure. Nothing was coming out. And he did whatever he could to keep Esav's eyes away from his daughter. Now, the Midrash says a, a startling statement. You, Yaakov, didn't want to marry her off permissibly. So now she's going to be taken away in a forbidden way. You could have married her off to Esav. Who knows? Maybe she would have had good effect on him. Maybe she would, he would have done teshuvah. Maybe she could have convinced him to be a better person. And the fact that you didn't want to marry her off permissibly, now you're going to get it. And that's why she was seized by this Gentile. It was a punishment for Yaakov, a punishment because he denied his daughter uh, to, his, uh, to his brother. So we now have to understand what exactly was taking place over here. Yaakov knew Esav well. They were brothers. They lived with each other for many years. And if everybody knew Esav and, and his evil schemes, it was, it was Yaakov. And if Yaakov actually thought that Dina could reform Esav, then he would have been the first one to make the match, if, if Yaakov really felt it. But he was convinced that if this matrimony would take place, it would be a tragedy for Dina, and it would be a ruined life for her, and he could never do such a thing. So if you think about it, Yaakov should be totally justified in not only taking his daughter and putting her in a, in a wooden trunk, but closing the lid and nailing the lid shut. He was probably even doing a mitzvah for, you know, for his daughter, to save his daughter from a, a, a regular marriage uh, that, that, that had no positive uh, repercussions from that, that would probably stem from it. You, you know, you, uh, most rabbis, if you were to ask them and say, listen, my daughter has a potential she do, but the guy is a murderer, <laughs> but, uh, but he really likes her. 
<laughs> the rabbi will tell you, what do you do? Get her away. Lock her up in a cabin and then close it shut. Bolt it with all the locks that you can find. Right? I think many people would say that. So yet the Chachamim say that Yaakov was punished uh, because he concealed Dina. So that's something that we need, we're going to understand tonight. So this question has been you know, asked and answered by many different people. Um, the altar of Slabadka, uh, one of the great Musar uh, yeshivas of the world, uh, said that Yaakov, yes, was he was fully justified in what he did. And there's, there's no criticism in the action that he took. He had no alternative. He was forced to hide his daughter. What did he do wrong? They would say that when he was closing the lid and he was nailing it shut, he was, to put it simply, he was banging it with too much force. What does that mean? Now, to, to, nail, to put a nail in wood, you require force, obviously. You know, nails just don't go in easily. But what are you feeling and what are you thinking when you are actually closing that lid? What he should have been thinking is, if I, would have, could have, if I could have just married my daughter to my brother, it would have been the happiest day of my life. If only my brother would have been worthy, if only he was a good person and I could have done this marriage, then it would have been great. And, 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 and this, is, this is hurting me that I have to close my daughter into this chest. Yaakov Avinu was punished for, for refusing his daughter to marry Asav? No, he wasn't. That's not true. Yaakov had to conceal his daughter because his, his brother was, was evil. Um, Yaakov was the Ishtam, Yosef O'alim. But the fact that it didn't bother him that, his, that he couldn't do it, that there was no chance whatsoever, that was a slight imperfection on, on, on the part of Yaakov. Now, you, could, you might like this explanation. You might not like this explanation. Um, but regardless of whether you like the answer to the question, it's going to lead us to the topic tonight. Um, that in Shamayim, in heaven, a person's thoughts are measured. Much more than they're th- over here. Here, in fact, they're not measured because nobody knows what another person is thinking right now. You could be thinking in your head, man, this rabbi has no idea what he's talking about. And I would know. You could be giving me the, the, the biggest smile. But I don't know what you're, what, what's going on in your head. But in heaven, it is measured. It's not enough just to do, but you also have to think. That's a big chidush. We would think it's enough to do. We would think it's, it's, it's perfectly fine. Just get, get done what needs to get done. And the thoughts being examined, ah, that's, that's extreme. And um, even though... The, the thing is fully permissible, but if the intent is not fully kosher, if the mind is not kosher, then the act becomes different. It's not the same act. The greater you want to be, the more refined your thoughts have to be. The Chovot HaLevavot, Duties of the Heart, one of the great Musar books of all time, um, he actually goes in depth about this. Because most people, again, think that purity of the mind is not a, a big subject to talk about. But he actually says, um, It's important not to neglect to examine your thoughts and their, your inner motives. Because when you do acts, when you perform actions, in most cases they are only valued based on the amount of intent that accompanies it. Everybody can pray tefillah. Everybody can read words. But if you don't have intent, if you don't have kavanah behind those words, then your tefillah doesn't really go far. That's a very important statement, what he just said. That the value of your act actually depends on how much you're invested in it. And how much you're willing to try. And how much you're, you're thinking of it. Because even the most beautiful act, the most beautiful deed, can be ruined and stained and deformed, be considered meaningless by lack of proper intent. And that's why the Chavot Levavot takes the time to let us know this. Al-Ken, he says, You should make an effort at all times that whatever you do should be thinking of God, specific to Hashem, whatever you're doing. Otherwise, you're losing the entire merit and the entire virtue and whatever reward of the act. Today, 
it, it, it's almost like we're, we're so we're, we're stooped so low that just if someone commits a, a good thing, oh Hazak Baruch, you know we got we got Minyan, we got Minyan on a winter day, you know we should be happy. Mincha was at 4.30, it's so hard to get a minyan, and they came, good, pat them on the back, and we're happy with that, we embrace the person. Their motives might be totally rotten, it could be they got a flat tire outside and they were stuck here, and that's, how, that's why they came to Jewel. And that because, I mean, that, now, you're keeping mitzvot, but you don't have the mind. How can it be? You, so, so here, down on earth, you're saying to yourself, okay, good job, let me give you a hug, you did an act. But in Shemaim, that's not the case. In heaven, it's not so. The motives are most important. And when something is done without participation of your mind, then the chief part of what of who you are, of your personality, is missing. That's why we say every single day in Uvalet Sion Goel, we say, should put in our hearts the fear of him and the love of him. Leman lo nigalarik velo neled la behala that we shouldn't toil in vain and that we shouldn't give birth for, for nothing. For nothing means without any proper intention, without purity of the heart, without enthusiasm. Uh, if it's done by habit, without any thought, if it lacks meaning, then we are laboring in vain. Um, so let's bring a few examples. You move into a house. You move into a house and you have to put mezuzot on your door. And of course, you're doing it because the Torah commands you to do it, right? So I take a mezuzah, I put it on all the doors of my house, and you're very, very happy. You paid good money for these mezuzahs. You went to the rabbi, you made sure that it was a good uh, parchment, and it was a good sofer, and he, everything's great. And you're standing by the door, and you're hammering in the mezuzah. But what's going on in your head when you're hammering in that mezuzah? The act, the act is great. Chazak, you fulfilled the mitzvah. But what, what's in the mezuzah? What's the mezuzah going to do for you? To protect your house? The rabbi said that the mezuzah protects my house from evil spirits and evil demons. <laughs> Good. So now what? The, the, the worst mazikim, the worst uh, damagers in life, if you fail to recognize what the mezuzah is doing for you. The mezuzah is a reminder of, of, of Kucha Berichu, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu who loves you. That's why the parasha of mezuzah is found in the first parasha of Shema, which is Ve'avta et Hashem Elohecha, Bechol Levavecha, Bechol Nafshecha, Bechol Nodecha. What's it doing there? What is, what, is the, what is the mezuzah have anything to do with loving God? Why is it even in that paragraph? Go put it in parasha Kedoshim, parasha Ki Tetzeh, we talked about Tzitzit, go put that in, that would be a nice place to put mezuzah. What is it doing now? Because that's what mezuzah is for. Is that we have to love God with all of our thoughts, with all of our emotions. So therefore when I put this mezuzah, that's what I have to think. That's what I think about. So now you're all saying to yourself, uh-oh, Mr. Bo, <laughs> I already put up my mezuzah when I moved to my house. I moved my house 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Now what? It's not, it's not too late. Because when you walk through a door, you put your hand in the mezuzah and you kiss the mezuzah. It's the only, it's the only uh, mitzvah that we have that we're constantly reminding ourselves of it. I always tell, I, I tell students that you know, it's not a mitzvah to kiss the mezuzah. The mitzvah from the Torah is to affix the mezuzah on the door. That's it. So why is it that every time we go out, we we're kissing the mezuzah? Why? why, why? Okay, I did the mitzvah. And now I'm protected. I got No, because the purpose of the mezuzah is to recognize the greatness of Hashem and the love of Hashem and the fear of Hashem. And every time I see that, that's... So, okay, you put up your mezuzah 10 years ago, 15 years ago in your home. But now every time you walk by, this is what you got to think about. What you think about every time you touch it. It's much better than just putting it up there and forgetting about it. You wear tzitzit. All right, men wear tzitzit. Now, some people put their tzitzit out, some people tuck it in. So I look at somebody else and I see their tzitzit out and, and, and I remember, the man tzitzkeru, the kol mitzvot Hashem, I look at the tzitzit and it reminds me of all the mitzvot of God. Very good. But what, what are you feeling when you're putting on your own tzitzit? Uritem oto. There's no end to what you should be thinking about. When mothers are putting tzitzit on their, on their sons, yeah, they're putting on tzitzit that every single morning is part of their uniform. Even the mother should be reminded of the mitzvot. Because I have to, I have to think about, this is ubanu bacharta mikol amin. Ubanu bacharta mikol am belason. We were chosen for, for this purpose. It doesn't take long. It's, it's a very quick thought. But it's a thought that has now transformed your act into something a lot more meaningful. And therefore, 
it's important to remember the, the intent that a person is, is, is thinking of every time he, do, he does so. Um, you know, think about tzedakah, okay? You have a dollar, you have a quarter, whatever it is. Now, it could be that you may not want to give the dollar. I'm not in the mood to give tzedakah. Okay, so you, you avoid this guy who's coming down the hall, so you go, go around and find another guy coming down the hall. Okay, now I'm stuck. They're both coming, now I got to give the tzedakah. Now, so you give, you give the quarter, you give the dollar, not, not the greatest act, but you still fulfill the mitzvah, okay? We're going to see that. You still fulfill the mitzvah. But imagine if you put a little thought into it. Imagine every time somebody walks into the Bet Knesset and he's collecting money for whatever cause that he's collecting, and we get quite a few of them every single day, almost. Imagine you're thinking, you know what? Hashem ohev anim. Hashem loves the poor. And Baruch Hashem, I'm in a situation that I can help. And therefore, I'm, I'm his emissary. I'm his shaliach. Hashem loves the poor people. And, and, and that now you're, you've just transformed uh, 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 from what would have been a, a, almost a meaningless act of taking a, a dollar or, or, or a nickel or whatever, five dollars, and giving it without any emotion. And now you've thought about it. Now, of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Eno Mekapeach Sachar Koberia. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't take reward away from anyone. If you're deserving of the reward, you will get the reward. He, you hung the mezuzah without thought, you're going to get the reward. You gave tzedakah because the guy, was, the guy bothered you and he said, please, 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 please. I'm like, okay, here, fine. You're still going to get the reward. But it's nothing compared to the greatness that you will achieve when you add thought to all, all the things that, uh, that we do. And if you, if you take this idea further, that it's not just a question of perfecting our mitzvot, it's a question of, per, of, of perfecting our entire lives. The Ramban, Nachmanides, famous Spanish uh, commentator in the Torah and the Mishnah, he makes a comment in the line in Perkei Avot. The line says, "Vechol ma'asecha yiyu l'shem shamayim," that all of your actions, all of your deeds, for the, be the sake of heaven. And the and the and the not Nachmanides, the Rambam. Rambam is Perus writes that there there are many books. If they were written, wouldn't be suffice to explain this statement. Now, we read this every single year when we, or every time you study Perkei Avot. All your actions should be for the sake of heaven. We agree with that. But why is the Rambam so excited? Why is he so turned on with this statement that he feels like we could write dozens of books for this? It's because this short statement is, is the lev. It is the heart. It's the nucleus of what we're here for. It's the most important element of our lives. V'chol ma'asecha. Everything you do. It's not just the mitzvah that you do. Kol ma'asecha. Not kol mitzvotecha yu l'shem shamayim. All of your actions should be l'shem shamayim. And that's not easy to do. But if you do it, it transforms your life. So because when a man looks at his daily schedule and his daily program, and most of us here today have our routine we know when we get up we know when we have breakfast we know when we get our first coffee second coffee and third coffee okay we know monday nights we're going to come here whatever it is you have your daily schedule and you will realize that probably only a very very small part of your schedule is devoted to service of usher um you have to make a living you have to go work so what's my service to hashem i come in the morning to pray i come in the afternoon to pray Maybe I get a half an hour of learning. Okay. Where's, but, but while you're at work, nine to five, where's your avodat Hashem? Where is your kol ma'asecha yul Hashem shamayim? Now, of course, well, Rabbi, I, I, during lunch, I, I wash my hands. I say, I say hamotzi. I say berkat hamazon. Chazak baruch. Okay, good. I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you 30 minutes. So now you got an hour in the morning. You got an hour a night. Maybe a 30 minutes of learning. So you have two and a half hours plus 30 minute lunch, three hours. But you're awake for 12 more. You're awake for 18. So you got three hours. That's not good. That's not a good average. You're not batting well. You'd probably be demoted to the minor leagues if, uh, if uh, you know, well, what are you going to come to Hashem with three hours a day? That's, what, that's my service of God? How does that work? So therefore, everybody has to get on board with Vechol Maasech Hayul Hashem Shemayim. So now, what does that mean, Rabbi? I can't enjoy life. Now, forget about it. Forget about my vacations. 
you know, I can't make money, I can't be rich, uh, you know, no, that's not what I'm saying. And to think that is wrong, you know, well, I, I, Rabbi, that means I can't marry, I can't marry a pretty girl. I, 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 Rabbi said, marry an ugly lady. Why? Because then it's Lashem Shamayim. It's for the, I'm getting married for the sake of heaven because if it was, it was a pretty girl, then I'm marrying her for her looks. I'm not marrying her. No, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. And to think that is wrong. You can marry a pretty girl. You can make money. You can go work. You can eat a big, big fat lunch, a nice shawarma lafa. You can get comfortable on your couch. You can sleep. You can relax. You can do all the things that you normally do day in and day out like you're doing right now. You just have to add the kavana, the intent of Lashem Shamayim. So, so then what's going to happen? A guy's going to look, and he goes, ah, that guy's a faker. That guy's a faker. He's fooling everybody. He's not doing a shamayim. He just wants to make money. Look at that. You're telling me that he's eating that shawarma sandwich, and then he's going to be lishem shamayim? Come on, give me a break, Rabbi. That's a mistake. It's not a mistake. Whatever you are, wherever you are, and whatever you're doing, you could transform your life with a little bit of thought. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't expect you to give up your livelihood. He doesn't expect you to just stop everything you have. But while you're busy living that life, why not add that intention? Why not add that kabana? It becomes, it becomes so meaningful now, your life. So the question is, how do we live with thought? How do we live like this? What, what are, what, what's the direction to take such a great ideal and incorporate it into, into our lives? Um, so let's talk about work. Most people here, the Ainara, are in the stage of their life where they're working. Maybe people listening are also working. If you're retired, Chazak Baruch. But uh, let's talk about work. There's a lot of people, I will probably vouch to say, that in the 90 percentile would say that they feel that their working is a total waste of time in life. Why do you work? I work to make money. End of story. I work because I gotta, I gotta provide for my family. Do you like what you do? Many people don't. Um, you, you get your, your, your pay stub at the end of two weeks or at the end of the month, and you look at half your salary is gone. Where? Oh, it's going to the government. It's going to taxes. Oh, even better. It makes me feel so good. Why? Why taxes? Ah, because the government has to support people who don't have jobs. <laughs> oh, oh, great. So now I'm working because there's a lot of people who are maybe lazy or don't want to work or whatever it is. Welfare. Welfare. That's, so, my, so half of my salary is going to that. So... Already, you probably don't like your job. You're just doing it because you have to put food on the table and put a roof over your head. And I got I to gotta give half of it away to the government because like, how, how is that supposed to make me feel good? And so, so therefore, you go to work. People go to work, whether it's an office job or it's a factory job or whatever it is, and he's miserable. And he feels that he's wasting his life day in and day out. So now you want to transform your life. You want to transform your work. How do you do it? So you practice on working the Shem Shammai. No change. You're still going to go to work. You're still going to drive to work. You're going to make your phone calls. And if you're a plumber, you're going to turn the pipes. And if you're an electrician, you're going to wire what you need to wire. You're just adding some thought to it. How do I add some thought? Well, let's see. The Torah tells us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants me to work. It's a command. Six days you shall work and you will do whatever you need to do. And then Yom Shabbat, Shabbat comes and you will. So now I'm going to work because I'm fulfilling a dictum of God in order to prepare me for Shabbat, which is a totally separate conversation. Okay, we can speak about that another time. But now I'm going to work, whether it is for the purpose of getting to Shabbat so I can enjoy Shabbat, or whether because God wants me to work, because I have a family, and He expects us to work to support ourselves, now I'm doing it, it's Rishon Hashem. It becomes the will of God. That's called Avodat Hashem. As surprising as it may seem, but when I'm thinking of that, I'm servicing God. I'm going to work because I got kids, and because of my kids, I'm doing this to raise a generation of holy, righteous individuals. I want to provide to, for them so that they can grow up and do whatever they want so that they can serve the community and they can serve their family. And I'm going to go support my wife. This, and that's why I'm going to work, to support your family. 
So you start off with one customer. You start off with one day. You start off with one client. I'm going to deal with this customer, L'Shem Shamayim. My dealings with him are for the purpose of Hashem. And the, the more frequently you think of that, then it changes your day completely. And the next day, you're going to deal with this guy, L'Shem Shamayim, and this lady, L'Shem Shamayim. I'm going to stock the shelves. I'm doing it, L'Shem Shamayim. Imagine you're a butcher. Imagine you're a butcher and you, you sell meat. And your whole life you sell meat, a lot of meat to customers. All, well, in the end of the day, what does he get? He makes money, like everybody else. That's, he likes meat, whatever it is. He has different cuts. Very good. But you can argue that at the end of the day, okay, what, what did you gain? But now, add one more element to it. If this Jewish butcher would stand behind the counter and say, you know what I do for a living? I make Jews enjoy life. I make Jews enjoy a good piece of meat. I make Jews experience Shabbat and Yom Tov like nobody else does. Because I provide them with the Simchat Yom Tov. Basar ve'yayin. Simchat Yom Tov, meat and wine. I do that. Especially in the olden days where you didn't have supermarkets, you just had meat sauce. You had to actually go to the butcher and tell him what piece of meat you wanted for your, for your Shabbat, for your Yom Tov. I want... The, back, the hind, I want the shoulder, I want this cut, the round cut. You told him what you wanted and he cut it for you. So instead of it just being a job and saying, okay, $69.99 a pound, you owe me 42 bucks. Now it's, look what I'm doing for this Jew. I'm helping him make that experience of Shabbat so much more meaningful. Now wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to do? And isn't it a, a, a shame, isn't it a pity that... that most business owners don't think like this. Most butchers don't think like this. Yeah? Yep, 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 yep. So that we, it shouldn't be a waste. So who, who are we working for? What about the people at home? What about the, the, the stay-at-home moms? Nashim Tzadkaniyot. Women that, that they stay home and they, they, they do what they can, and uh, you know, some of them nowadays may have to work so side jobs, but a lot of that was that was that's the way of life it was many years ago. You're, you're working hard, you're toiling for your children, making, making sure the house is in order for when your husband comes home, dinner is ready. You have a lot of kids, it just you know, it surmounts and it just it, it becomes almost impossible, but they work, they work hard. I don't take anything away from that. But let me ask you one question. How are you different than, a mo- than a non-Jewish mother who's also staying at home? And the answer is you're probably not. You might have Shabbats and Yom Tovs, but the non-Jewish mothers who are staying at home are also taking care of their kids and also getting their kids dressed and showered and doing their homework and, and, and di- dinner on the table and the house tidied up for them and their husbands come home. So now, obviously, it's much, it's much better than if you just worked for yourself and just, you know, you want to be that independent woman who didn't want to get married and didn't want to raise a family. But now, what happens if you change that intent? What if, when you're making the dinner, when you're cleaning the house, or when you're getting your kids dressed and you're get, helping them take a shower, it's, I'm raising Jews who are mamlechet koanim, begoy kadosh. I'm raising a, 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 a little children who are part of a nation of priests and, and a goy kadosh, a holy nation. And these, these little boys and girls are going to be of the Hashem. They're going to be little God servants. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm, 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 and I'm waking up super early to prepare the lunches and getting them dressed. And I know it's a rush and it's, and it's, and it's so hectic every single morning to get carpool and I to drop them off, but I'm dropping them off in their Jewish schools so that they can get that education and, when, and when, when a Jewish mom feeds her child, she's also an emissary of Hashem, who is potech et yadecha lechol Hashem who opens up his hand and satiates all the living. And I'm, I'm, I'm giving that to my kids because without my kids, they can't eat. Without me, they can't eat. They don't know how to make food. So now I'm fulfilling this, this pasuk that we say every single day. And that's how you're different than the non-Jewish moms. That's what makes, you, that's what makes us different. It's not just in the matter when we feed our children or we get them dressed, even when we do it. No one's saying that you're not allowed to chew your food. 
There was once a guy who said, okay, ah, the rabbi said I should not take any pleasure in this world, so I'm not chewing my food. And he just swallowed his food straight up until he got sick. Went to the doctor, what's going on? I just swallowed my food. Go, well, that's why you're sick. A part of the digestive system, needs, you need to chew your food. And he's, God created you with saliva in order for that purpose, to chew your food. It says, Ve'achalta ve'savata. You shall eat and be satiated. Not ubalata ve'savata, and you swallow and be satiated. There's no eating. There's nothing wrong with eating. Let the, let the saliva run. Let the, the juices of your stomach do what they need to do. Enjoy. Go to town. Go out with friends. Go to a restaurant. Enjoy life. Spend money. Spend, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to eat bread with, 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 with salt. Those are for the great, great, great tzaddikim, the Baba. We're not on the Baba Sali level. We're not the Baba Sali levels. Even the Baba Sali had his, had his arak also. And we're not on those levels. We can, we can enjoy. But while you're enjoying them, while you're having your steak, while you're having your shawarma, while you're having your sugani and your sushi, do it for the, uh, what, what's, what's, your, what's your intent? What's going on in your mind? Try it. Try it when you go, well, right now when you're having your food. Try when you go home. You say, okay, I'm eating this food because I'm ser- I-, I want my body to be healthy so I can serve Hashem. And all your families go look at you and they think you're from outer space. What, what, what happened here? What, what, what did mom just say? <laughs> what, what happened? You know, they're going to think you're crazy. Okay, they're going to think you're crazy day one, day two, and all of a sudden, you're going to say it every day. And if you're too embarrassed to say it out loud, just say it to yourself. Say it to yourself. I want to make my body healthy so I can serve God. And if you sit down to eat with that intent, you serve God, and you have the power to, to transform your deeds and your actions into something much more uh, noble and much more precious in the eyes of God. Even when you sleep, even when you sleep, that's what it is. Say something, I'm going to sleep, it will, it will revitalize who you are. It will revolutionize your entire mode of living. And imagine how you will turn out to be if you keep on doing this frequently, day in and day out. Imagine a man and a woman is convinced, now I'm sleeping not because I'm tired, I'm sleeping because this is the Ratzon Hashem. This is what God wants. And after a while, you now expand this into all parts of your life. Bechol ma'asecha. Yud Hashem Shemayim. All of your actions should be the Shem Shemayim. It's a pity to just do, 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 do without infusing in our actions what we are thinking. Because once you add thought and your intentions are noble, you acquire something very valuable. And that was Yaakov's mistake. And that was his mistake. That he could have he just, ah, if, if only my brother was good enough that I, can, I, I would want to give my daughter to, to marry him. But no, he was too thrilled with just nail it down as hard as you can. No way is he going to see my daughter. And because he was such a tzaddik, the measures of the tzaddik, the, the, the actions of the tzaddik are, are measured with a very, very fine tool. And, uh, and, and with the combination of, of Yaakov's lack of thought and with Dina going out to scour the land or scour the girls, that led to very, very tragic consequences. It's one answer. You don't have to, you don't have to agree with the answer or accept why that's why what, what happened. Uh, to, although Rashi does bring the whole thing with the box. That's not something made up. Rashi quotes Amid Rashi. But nevertheless, the, uh, the, the foundation, the Yesod, is there. That our actions should go hand in hand with the thoughts, should be accompanied by proper thoughts, proper kavanot. And when you do so, eventually you will expand you call ma'asecha l'shem shamayim. That is the goal. That's how we transform our lives. That's how we become different people, different mothers, different fathers, different individuals, different workers, employees, employers, whatever it is. Our lives will change. Bezat Hashem should be zocheh to that and much more. Amen. Have a wonderful night.